my name's Mike, and I'm a designer in the entertainment industry. What do I do? I create concept designs for films and games, but I'm going to be talking today because I'm really disillusioned with film, specifically with summer blockbusters and modern movie making. And I wanted to talk about the forgotten art of storytelling, because we can learn how to make great movies again just by looking at master movie makers and the master storytellers. And for me, one of my heroes is this guy, um, James Cameron. And he's made what for me is one of the most important films I've ever watched. I've watched it a lot of times. And I've chosen to talk about it because it's a film that everyone, hopefully everyone here has at least heard of. Um, but it's also a film that's critically acclaimed across the last 25 years that even my mum likes this film. To, to sort of clarify the idea of a blockbuster director, these two guys are both directors and they both make blockbusters. But I think we can agree that Michael Bay and James Cameron don't make the same type of movie, even though they're technically the same role. So I tried to look at it objectively and I actually started to look into what exactly these directors are stimulating when we watch their movies. So I turned to psychology and neuroscience and I discovered a theory of the brain called the triune brain theory, which breaks down the brain into three separate parts based on the age of evolution. Now, the first part is the reptilian complex, which is the oldest part of the brain, and we share it with other, other creatures, the lizards, birds, they have it too, which is our fight or flight, it's our fear, it's our stimulus brain that reacts to the environment around us, and it only wants to satisfy survival and reproduction. It's a very, very uh, goal-oriented piece of the brain. The second part that we developed like, fairly recently is the limbic system, which is the part of us that interacts with each other, that has empathy for other, other people, that has the idea of family and relationships, and it has the, the currency of emotions. And the third part, which is really new, is the neocortex, which is what we use when we create things, when we deal with abstract thought, when we deal with uh, problem solving, with planning. The first part of the brain deals with biological stimulus, which is basically pleasure and fear, which is just a chemical response that we can manipulate directly. The second stage is social emotions, which is interacting with each other and interacting with uh, basic social situations. And the third part is like metaphors. That's the main currency of the abstract neocortex. And I found that when I started to look at movies using this lens, specifically if I look, I'm gonna show you a clip now from Armageddon, the Michael Bay movie. And I just want you to notice how little attention is given to any human component and any kind of pattern searching capacity. It's basically a giant abstract noise of visual stimulus. And the main goal of it is to keep your reptilian brain constantly engaged with visual data. Michael Bay operates in this area with no, no attempt to have patterns, metaphors, or emotions. He just operates on one part of the brain and maxes it out to the limit. When you have visual stimulus thrown at you, it doesn't matter what it is, you will release dopamine into your reward system because Without that dopamine, you might miss potential threats or potential um, rewards. So you've evolved to simply be, key, be engaged by anything novel that is changing on the screen. The more you throw information at people, the more they will just be stuck, magnetized on a very basic pleasure loop. But this guy uses all three levels, and I'm going to explain how he does it today. So by using all three levels simultaneously, we get rich film experiences and game experiences. So while Bay deals in literal colorful transformation, Cameron deals in social and metaphorical transformation of characters, of heroes. So to understand this guy, you need to understand a bit about the most classic storytelling format, which is myth. And this guy on the right, Joseph Campbell, he went in throughout his entire life and studied mythology. When, when we think about myth, I'm, I'm very conscious of the fact that you might be thinking about biblical tales or really old stories, but that's actually not what myth is, and it's certainly not religious. What it actually is, is a symbolic story that helps convey moral and practical lessons. And Terminator 2 and Star Wars are actually in this category. Now, what Joseph Campbell did was travel the world from North America to Sub-Saharan Africa, all the way down to tribes from like Papua New Guinea, and he collected what their stories were that they were told between generations for thousands of years. And he found that when he was looking at them, that basically they were all the same entire uh, continents away, people were telling the same stories using exactly the same motifs, the same themes. For example, the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden was predating Christianity three, three and a half thousand years. And it was like coming up in different places across the, across the planet. And 
to illustrate like what he discovered was the function of the whole myth telling um, kind of process, I'm actually going to hand off a quick clip by a neuroscientist called David Eagleman describing the story of Ulysses in the context of trying to go to the gym, a very contemporary issue. In classical mythology, the hero Ulysses lashed himself to the mast of his ship so that he could hear the bewitching song of the sirens without steering into the rocks. Ulysses knew that his future self wasn't going to be in any position to make a good decision. So he structured things so that he couldn't do the wrong thing. This sort of deal that's struck between your present and your future self is known as a Ulysses contract. My own Ulysses contract is to arrange with a friend to meet me here at the gym. And that way the social pressure lashes me to the mast. This allows me to be the person I want to be, making good decisions, resisting the seductive power of now. So the idea behind a myth is that it basically brings through the vessel of a story, it brings you a value that you can apply to life. And it doesn't tell you, it teaches you through experience. That's the whole point of a story that we embody ourselves in the heroes and we, we see ourselves in the protagonist and we learn from the way that they behave and we learn from their decisions. That They are ideals for navigating life. And when I mean navigating life, what I'm actually talking about is, is a theory of psychology called stages of life, which is that when you're born, you're born as a dependent infant to your, to your parents and then you go through different stages from dependent infant through to child, through to adult, through to parent, elder, dependent elder, and death, unfortunately. Now, each of these stages is utterly new to you before you go into it. It's not something you have experience with, so myths are there to help you prepare for that new territory. And in mythology, it's always the same motif of each stage of life is represented by a death and rebirth. Now, Joseph Campbell basically collected all of this, this theory into volumes and volumes of work, and then he synthesized those volumes of work into one concise formula for storytelling, which has been used in uh, Hollywood with all of the best movies from The Matrix to The Lion King to Finding Nemo to Star Wars is this idea of the monomyth. It's the structure under which all uh, great myths and great stories are told. And it's, it's a shared structure between all of these, these great stories. So I'm going to take you through the 12 steps. And the 12 steps is a simplified version based upon a guy called Christopher Vogler who worked on The Lion King. He was a story consultant um, back in 1985, and he simplified the whole structure so that it was like a Hollywood memo, which is what I'm going to give you now. So in the first step, a hero ventures forth from the ordinary world into a realm of supernatural wonder. This is all metaphor, of course. In the second step, uh, the hero encounters fabulous forces, a victory is won, a reward is gained. And in the third step, a hero returns from the adventure to share the reward with his fellow man. It seems overly simplified, but that's basically pretty much every story that you, you've seen with a hero in it, that's it, effectively. Now, to understand the 12 independent steps, we need to break it down into its various stages. And the first stage in the context of Star Wars, which I'm gonna use because I presume that all of us have seen Star Wars, the first step is the ordinary world. Now, in this uh, scene of Star Wars, it's Luke. He's a farm boy. He's living with his auntie and uncle, but he dreams of joining the rebellion. In the second step, there's the call to adventure. Now, the call to adventure is when the hero receives something, whether it be from fate or whether it be uh, some supernatural aid. And in the case of Star Wars, it's the message from Princess Leia asking for the help of Obi-Wan Kenobi. So Luke goes off on a little adventure, finds Obi-Wan Kenobi, which is described in the hero's journey structure as meet the mentor. And Obi-Wan says, we must go and help this princess. And Luke immediately, because he's afraid, he doesn't want to leave home, he doesn't really know what he's doing, he says, no, I can't do that, which is the refusal of the call. Then, of course, his auntie and uncle get butchered by the Empire, so he goes and joins Obi-Wan and goes and crosses the threshold. This is the moment, the symbolic moment, when the hero leaves the ordinary world, the farm, and then goes and crosses a threshold into a new space, which is when they go to the Tatooine spaceport. Um, now, from there on in, it's stage six is, is multiple steps. It's tests, allies, and enemies. It's finding new skills. It's creating alliances. It's finding out who's, who's good and bad people. And there's various steps to it. It's basically preparing for the big climax at the end of the story. Then there's the approach, which is the the kind of build up, the anticipation of going into what Joseph Campbell refers to as the belly of the whale, because in ancient mythology, uh, ancient tribes would always use the concept of a, a warrior being eaten by a whale for some reason. It was just a thing. 
Um, but if you replace a whale with a giant Death Star, then you've basically got a contemporary equivalent to an ancient uh, concept. So they go through the ordeal, which is in the belly of the, the whale, they go through this uh, great risk, and then they come away uh, having, having some loss on the way, sacrifice of some sort, uh, which is Obi-Wan dying, and then they have a reward, which is basically freeing the, the, the princess who's stuck, and then they, they have the road back where they run away from the enemy. In the case of uh, Star Wars, it's the, the action sequence where they're shooting the TIE fighters. And then in the next stage, it's the return to the ordinary world, but having become resurrected in a new way, which is that Luke becomes resurrected as, as a rebellion pilot, what he wanted to be from the beginning. They go to the Death Star, destroy it, and then through that act of destruction, they have the final stage, which is return with the elixir, which is coming back with knowledge, uh, what Joseph Campbell refers to as the boom, which is a kind of antiquated way of saying experience, knowledge, and wisdom. So the whole idea of the hero's journey is that you start in one position. In the case of Luke, it's this uh, farm boy who's still at home living with his auntie and uncle. And by the end, he's an independent rebellion pilot. Now, what I'm sure some of you are thinking, I empathize with, with the idea of, wait, like how can one structure possibly encompass so many stories? And I thought about that for a while, and then I realized that there's a really good analogy in the case of faces. Now, every single person you've ever met shares the same facial structure of the skull. Now, every single person has a unique face, but it sits on top of the same structure. When was the last time you went up to somebody and said, I'm really bored of your unoriginal face? <laughs> like, it just doesn't happen. Like, um, now, you can break the rules. I'm not being some sort of a you know, story Nazi here. Like, you can break the rules. In the case of art, you know, abstract art breaks the structure of things, but you wouldn't want to spend two hours of a movie interacting with a character that has no structure. The same way you wouldn't want to look at a story that's got no structure, because it would be incomprehensible. So, in the case of Terminator 2, when I started to really look deeply at it, I realized there were all sorts of things that I had never noticed, having watched it like 50 times. What Cameron does is he uses the monomyth structure exactly. You couldn't come up with a more crystal clear use of the monomyth structure than Terminator 2. It follows it down to a T. And he does it with the combination of making sure that he has abstract metaphors, he has social issues, and he has action. Now, most people, when they copy a film, they only see the action and they think that's it. And they miss the nuance of the social interactions and the metaphors, which is what actually really activates your brain. So, what we're gonna delve really quickly into is the social brain. Specifically, this is really useful for you if you're a character designer, for example. And we need to look at what the currency of the social brain is. And this, the currency is archetypes. Now, archetypes is a word that was basically set up by Carl Jung, a Swiss uh, psychoanalyst. And he used, it, he used the, the phrase to describe a system of characteristics in every psyche. It's characteristics that we all have the potential of in our brains. The, the most fundamental archetypal uh, kind of images are the mother, the father, and the child. Now, it's fundamental because every single human being in this room, they at least possess uh, a position that, that qualifies them to understand this relationship pattern. Now, the archetypes are not actually specifically, they're not gender, they've got nothing to do with the mother archetype being a female. It's qualities that you exhibit as a person. Now, the mother archetype is about feeding, nurturing, and soothing. The father archetype is about stern, controlling, and powerful. And the child archetype is symbolic of birth, salvation, and beginning. Now, these are qualities that uh, a whole balanced person should be able to exhibit. So different characters represent different parts of your psyche. So when you've got the balance of all of those three archetypes in a family unit, you have a family archetype which is balanced and healthy and all good. Now, I have a story for is to take characters that are broken and then to fix them. If they're already fixed, there's no story. If everyone's already ideal at the beginning of the story, where the hell do you go? So what Cameron does is he starts off by having the mother figure, Sarah Connor, be this deranged psychopath who's in a mental institute. And by the end of the film, she's going to be a nurturing mother figure. We have John, who is basically a social rebel, stealing money from banks at the beginning, lives in a foster family, doesn't really have any guidance. And then we have the Terminator, who is, well, a robot assassin. And by the end of the film, he will have grown to have basically attained the values of the father archetype. Now, I know I'm oversimplifying things. It's not the A to B that's important. It's how we get from A to B that makes it a stimulating experience. 
So by the end of this film, these guys will be a family archetype, but at the beginning, they are completely broken and fractured, and it's the visual storytelling through the movie and the action that's actually gonna show this transformation. So the subtext of Terminator 2, the, the entire thread that runs through the entire film is the simple idea of John Connor moving from childhood to manhood. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at one sequence uh, from the structure of the monomyth, the call to adventure, then we're gonna look at refusal of the call and then crossing the threshold. It's one sequence, three scenes. So first of all, the call to adventure. I'm gonna show you three clips. The first is, a, is what I call a primer. It's the setup of the scene. The second will be the threshold, which is where there's a symbolic death and rebirth. And then the third will be the conclusion where the transformation of the character has, has taken place. And it's all gonna happen with visual design and action. Just remember that this is the primer and the subtext is John going from child to man. I'll be back, all right? Cool. Okay, so that's just the setup, but already you'll see, look at the situation. We've got John Connor, and he's in this uh, camo -like outfit. We know he's gonna be the future like military leader, but he's playing war games, and he's in an arcade filled with, with, with children, while two figures, a rebel biker and a policeman, are looking for him. And this is all basically foreshadowing what's about to kick off in the next scene. So now we're gonna go, that was the first scene, John as a child. Now we're gonna move into the threshold scene as he basically gets confronted by the Terminators. John. Not now, not now. Hey, man, there's this cop scoping for you. Check it out. Split, man, just go. Yeah. Ah! Hey, man, I think I saw that kid you were looking for. Hey! So the, the main thing to remember is the idea of thresholds, that there's constant movement through different spaces that represent change in the character. Now, and you notice how prominent this art light passageway is. John is in a safe zone, and then on the other side of that threshold is the policeman. And when he crosses through that threshold, and John goes and descends into the underbelly of the mall's maintenance uh, realms, he's basically moving symbolically away from his safe mall environment. And the symbolic threshold moment, the death, is when the Terminator's roses fall to the ground and he crushes them. Now, this motif you're going to see again and again in Terminator, and it helps us understand symbolically what's going on in this scene. So, at the moment before the John sees the Terminator, things are normal, it's the ordinary world. The moment he sees a seven-foot guy in a leather jacket with a shotgun standing on roses is a fairly clear indicator that things are changing a little bit. I, I would feel the same, I think. So. In the first scene, he's a kid playing video games. In the second scene, he comes across this symbolic confrontation and he decides to run because that's a fairly natural response. <sighs> Notice in the setup of the scene, this isn't some multi-dimensional fight happening. This is the most dualistic scenario you can think of. Left and right. On the left, 
is this policeman, and on the right is a rebel biker, and John is stuck in the middle. It's a clearly dualistic scenario where the audience understands completely what the conflict is. Now, we know that John has no idea what the hell is going on at this point, but the idea of duality is like massively important in storytelling because the audience needs to know what the hell is going on. Now, duality, life, death, hot, cold, above, below, north, south, these are all opposites. And if we don't have opposites in the story, then no one knows what the hell's going on. You have to have a broad spectrum with extremes. Now, on the left, we have the ultimate symbol of authority, and on the right, we have the ultimate symbol of anarchy and rebellion. We have the rebel biker in his leather-clad jacket. Now, there is a very important reason why Cameron has done this. And in order to understand it, and to understand Star Wars, you need to understand uh, a theory of psychology by a guy called Carl Jung, who I mentioned previously. And the relationship that we have to authority as we go through life. Now, if we look at the stages of life again, and on the bottom we have the axis of just time, and then we introduce a new axis, which is responsibility. Now, as you go through your life, you start life utterly without responsibility. You are dependent upon parents and institutions to look after you. So you have an understanding of authority figures. And then as you go through the stages of life towards adulthood, Ideally, you should develop a sense of self-responsibility. This is what the process of, of education and mythology is supposed to help you get to. Early childhood and childhood is all about being dependent to authority, and as you get older, you descend back into a state of dependency as you lose your, your capacity to look after yourself. So we have to prepare for those stages. But the biggest and most important component of those stages is that the movement from childhood to adulthood is about confronting authority and becoming responsible for yourself. Now, John is not going to be the leader of men if he needs to look to a policeman for assistance. So the reason that there is the authority figure as the antagonist is because it's symbolic of John's movement to manhood. It's the same thing in Star Wars. We've got Luke, who's this farm boy living at home with his auntie and uncle, and he wants to leave home, join the rebellion, and fight the Empire. And the Empire is his father. So it's the same underlying human relatable issue of growing up. Now, in the case of Terminator 2, John is the leader of the resistance in the same way that Luke is the leader of the rebellion. It's the same underlying principle. It's the same situation told with a slightly different skin. And there's nothing wrong with that. So that was one scene. We're, we're now going to move on to the refusal of the call. So we've looked at one section, one scene in the sequence. The refusal of the call is very, very quick and easy. John makes a run for it. He gets back on his bike. And just take note of the very toy nature of the bike. It's basically like a, like a piece of Lego, practically. Multicolored. It's weak. He can barely get it started. And the authority figure is chasing him. But he's basically in serious trouble right now because he's a kid on a toy bike. So once that scene happens, we then go to the storm drains, which is where John basically continues to try and run away from this situation that's going to drag him into adulthood. So in this scene, we're going to go through three steps again, beginning, middle, and end, a primer, a threshold, and a payoff. In the first scene, he's going to be symbolically a child. Then there's going to be a threshold moment where there's a symbolic death. And then he's going to be resurrected as an adult symbolically through the visual storytelling. So let's cut to the first scene. And I want you to just pay attention when you're watching this, pay attention to the framing, to the cinematography, the settings, and the passageway that John goes through as he leads into this scene. <laughs> got this, this figure that descends from the sky down into to John's realm. Now, if you think about it in Greek mythology, it would be some winged hero wearing sandals or something. But you want to contemporize that? You make it like a time-traveling cyborg. Sweet. It's the same thing. It's just, it's the same symbology. It's the descent from the sky of some ominous figure. And we're going to see that repetition of descent from above in the next scene. But notice the, the, the scene John comes under through the threshold of the bridge. And you're going to see the bridge come back in a second. It's really important. 
and he looks back. It's really important to your unconscious, not to your conscious brain. He looks back and he's looking to see if he's clear, whether the threat is over. And of course it's not. When the, the truck comes crashing down, he realizes that he's not, he's not quite free of this yet. So that was the first scene, John on his toy bike looking back. And now we're gonna go through the threshold moment where John has a symbolic death and rebirth through the visual storytelling and the action. Notice we've had no dialogue. All of this development is happening through physical action. So, next scene. Terminator, the, the dualistic opposite of the T-1000, the Rebel, comes down from above, same as the T-1000 does. There's a clear dualistic scenario, left and right, they're in a corridor, and he squeezes past the T-1000 and then lifts John off the boy bike, the baby bike, onto the man bike, where he represents the protecting archetypal father. Same way that the roses represented the end of John's, you know, very uh, romantic childhood, Cameron is using a symbol of that stage of life. His little bike, and now he's on the man bike. So the first stage, boy bike. Second stage, that bike is crushed. And now we're going to look at the third stage. And now I want you to notice again the reuse of the bridge that we went through at the beginning of this scene. So by the end of the scene, John's on the man bike with this protecting guardian figure looking back at the bridge. But what I want you to notice is something you would never be able to consciously recognize, but your unconscious does because it's looking for patterns of meaning. And that is the cinematography and the repetition of the exact same entry into the scene as the exit from the scene so that we can compare the transformation. So they both come through on motorbikes on the left of the bridge they pass under, we look back. The first time John is alone, scared, looking back. The second time, both of them look back together. And then while we're looking back at this same shot, the, the second time it's a burning blockage. And look at the comparison between reactions. The cinematography is the same. And the truck has been reduced to a burning tire because Terminator's there to help John. It's pure visual storytelling. And you never ever would notice that they're the same cinematography, but your brain does. That's how it can recognize that a transformation has happened because your brain remembers you don't. So this is me, by the way, at that bridge. Uh, <laughs> some, some people go to the beach. Uh, I go on holiday to visit storm drains and generally geek out. Now imagine you're, you're going through a weight loss program and you wanna show your transformation. You don't show a picture of your face and then show a picture of your body to show before and after. You do this. You cannot recognize transformation unless there is similarity of context. And that's what Cameron is doing intentionally to allow you to see John before, John after. John baby bike, John man bike with father archetype. So the beginning of that scene, John's a, bike, uh, John's a boy on a bike. The middle, his bike is crushed, end of childhood. At the end, John's looking up at this slightly unusual character that's just basically saved him from certain death. So, your brain is digesting this at the speed of light because your unconscious is infinitely more powerful than your conscious brain. Now, if I ask you to remember information about a story, you'll remember it for years. 
If I ask you to remember a seven digit number, you will forget it within 10 seconds because the digit number is part of language, which is in the neocortex, and the neocortex is not very good at retaining data. However, it does retain information that pertains to the limbic system, to emotions, and to physical action because those parts of the brain are the oldest. They are built to be active all the time, whether or not you're conscious of it. So in the first uh, scene, it's John playing video games in an arcade, being a true child. Then that ends pretty badly with the Terminator crushing the rose. John's afraid. He makes a run in the, in the refusal of the call. And in the third scene, the crossing the threshold into the special world of manhood, he is on his baby bike. That baby bike gets crushed. And now he's under the guidance of this, this uh, mythological warrior, as it were, in the form of a cyborg from the future. So I'm now going to show you two scenes. The first scene happens before any of that sequence actually took place. And the end of the sequence will happen uh, to basically close off the sequence. Now, how this works is with a with psychological principle, but I just want you to watch this next scene, and I want you to consciously ask yourself something you would never do while watching a movie. What questions does this scene raise in your mind if you've never seen the film before? <laughs> Questions your unconscious brain asks, why is this Terminator looking for John and who sent him and what's he going to do? Now I want you to see what happens when Cameron finishes the sequence in the storm drains. Watch where he takes us to give closure to those questions. Okay, time out. Stop the bike. Time out. Come on, stop the bike. Now, don't take this the wrong way, but you are a Terminator, right? Yes. Cyberdyne Systems Model 101. I'm a cybernetic organism, living tissue over a metal endoskeleton. You're not here to kill me. I figured that part out for myself. So what's the deal? My mission is to protect you. Yeah? Who sent you? You did. 35 years from now, you reprogrammed me to be your protector here, in this time. So in the first scene, the unconscious question is raised, why is the guy looking for John? And in the second scene, we get the answers. Why is he looking for him? Because he needs to protect child John. Who sent him? Adult John. Now, the exposition is invited because unconsciously, we've raised that question ourselves and now we're looking for a conclusion. So the reason this works is actually a psychological effect that was discovered by a Soviet psychologist called Bluma Zygonik. The unresolved cognitive tasks cause dissonance. They make you basically it, it fractures your, your, your peace of mind, which is why when you forget someone's name, for example, you're walking down the street and suddenly it pops up in your head because your unconscious is trying to solve the problem. What we just saw was a sequence, a crafted, beautiful sequence of action that pushed constantly the story forward, pushed the development of the character forward, it pushed everything forward. From the beginning, where we have an unco unconscious question, all the way through to the end, it's constant visual metaphor. It was simple visual storytelling done in the best possible way. So what we just saw is basically biological, physical action sequences representing social transformation told through metaphor. This is activating all three sections of your brain. It's not just noise. It's not just big explosions. They're very calm action sequences when you think about it, but they affect us because we, re we realize the social relevance of them. So, We've just looked at John, who's our child archetype, and now we're going to jump the tracks and look at Sarah, who's her evolution as a character, and see the visual storytelling that's happening here. Now, we're going to look at the call to adventure. I'm just going to show you the clip, and her call to adventure happens with a dream sequence where she's in a mental institute, and she's having a dream where she's visited by John's father, who was murdered in the first film. So she runs down this uh, dream sequence, and she gets outside, and we have a dualistic scenario that relates to her archetype. So she's had to be the, the father archetype for John for his entire life because Kyle dies in the first film and she has to raise him to be a military leader. But she's been locked out of ever having motherhood. So in this simple dualistic scenario, she's looking through a wire fence at children who are about to be burned by Skynet and no one can hear her scream. Now, this is important because when you see the next scene, 
you're going to see some similarities with the scene architecture between John's call to adventure and Sarah's call to adventure that your neocortex saw, but you didn't. Cortex is looking for patterns and it will look at it through the context of a scene, the cinematography, the sound effects. It's all going in there and it's being looked at and filtered for patterns and associations. That's the main function of a neocortex. And Sarah's nightmare is coming to the end of that hallway, opening the doors and seeing Skynet kill children. And in John's sequence, he runs to the end of the hall, opens the door and he finds Skynet in a completely different form. So if we move to the crossing the threshold for Sarah, you're going to start seeing some similarities with the, the scene architecture again. I'm going to do the same thing. One scene is the primer, then the threshold where there's a symbolic rebirth and then uh, taking through to a payoff. So this is the first scene of the Terminator and John going to get Sarah from the Mental Institute. see how sunglasses can be a symbol for the character and the entire scene that we're about to see is driven by one single prop sunglasses the sunglasses don't look at what they are look at what they mean to the character now the Terminator puts on the sunglasses at the beginning of the film and it seems like a gimmick he takes the sunglasses off the biker he wears these sunglasses for the entire first half of the film because in the next scene the threshold moment we need to see the transformation of Sarah's state of mind from being terrified to being basically ready to interact with a Terminator. He's her worst fear. So beginning of that scene, she falls to the floor and looks up at this guy in sunglasses. Now watch what happens when we transform through the threshold scene. No! Help her! Wait here. Hurry up! Hurry up! Kill us all! They'll kill us all! Oh no! They'll kill us all! No! He's here to help. It's okay. When he has his, his glasses broken, they're broken by an authority figure that's trying to keep Sarah locked in a mental institute. So they have a shared antagonist. But the reason they get broken off his face is so that we have as an audience the moment of seeing him in the, in the eyes, and she sees him in the eyes. Now in the first part of that scene, she's on the floor looking up at him and is terrified looking into the sunglasses of a robot killer. And then at the moment where there's the threshold moment, which is the, the, the touching of the hands, the, the human contact, this is the first time that Sarah has ever made eye contact with a Terminator. And this activates our sympathy for the situation in the limbic system. So now watch what happens as we end this scene, as they make a run, having just gone through that threshold moment. Go! So, repetition of the motif. 
things being crushed by the feet of Terminators. The first time, it's John's end of childhood. The second time, it's the foreshadowing of the end of Sarah's fear of Terminators. She's going to make the transition from fearful neurotic to hopeful mother. Now, what's necessary for that transition is for her to be relieved of her fear of Terminators, which is the source of all of her nightmares. So, in the beginning of the scene, we see her looking into the eyes of a robot killer with sunglasses on. In the second half of the scene, the sunglasses are removed and she makes like physical contact and eye contact. And in the third scene, the, uh, the glasses are crushed. It's exactly the same motifs that you saw in the, the roses and with the motorbike of John's childhood. These are visual storytelling motifs that your unconscious recognizes, but you don't. Now, back to Neocortex Association, watch what happens when you cut the uh, architecture of John's call to adventure with Sarah's crossing the threshold. Get down. Go. Same situation, exactly the same scene architecture with slightly adjusted details. In the beginning scene, Terminator is assassin killer. We have low cinematography looking up at this imposing character with sunglasses on, and he holds the shotgun like a machine. In the second scene, Cameron brings the camera up to eye level so that we can see him in the face, and he starts to handle the shotgun like a human being with a bit more romance and a bit more flourish. Now, you don't consciously notice it, but your brain does. This is how you feel a film as it progresses. So this even relates down to the conflict, of the, the staging of the conflict. So when they go and have a fight in the hallway in the mall, and they have a fight in the mental institute, it's the same setup. <laughs> Cameron is literally reusing the same motifs. And what are the motifs? It's conflict with authority. One authority is keeping Sarah locked up wrongfully, and the other authority is about stopping John from growing up. It's all symbolism, and it flies straight into your limbic system because that's what the limbic system understands from millions of years of evolution, having to become a socially adept creature. So the beginning of the scene, we've gone through that sequence, but as in all mythology, you've got to prime the sequence and you've got to end it. And we're gonna see some motifs that, that Joseph Campbell describes directly in mythology, in regards to them entering the Mental Institute and then leaving the Mental Institute. So this is them arriving at the gates of the Mental Institute, which would be the equivalent in mythology would be like arriving at the, the, the front of a cave and finding a, a, a dwarf that protects it or something. Visiting hours is 10 to 4, Monday through Friday. What the hell are you doing? You son of a bitch! You shot me! He'll live. Now, when they arrive, it's important. With all the conflicts in Terminator 2, they never have conflict with anyone but authority figures. It's always security guards who have the institutional badge of authority. And this is what's known as threshold guardians in mythology. There's always somebody that guards the, the inner sanctum or the belly of the whale. Now, when we start, they turn up on the rebel bike, then they descend into the parking lot. Now, I know I'm going into details here that you probably think are irrelevant, but they're important when you're making stories. If they just rocked up through the gate, pulled up to the front door and walked in the reception, where's the theatricality and the, the escalation of tension? So they descend down below, and we're gonna see this uh, be repeated, the, the transformation of their entrance to their exit. Reload. Hang on! Now, when they arrive, they turn up on a rebel motorbike, and when they leave, they've commandeered an authority vehicle, and in the beginning there's two, in the end there's three. And they use the same entrance that they came in, and we transform the context. 
So the beginning, they turn up and they're on a bike. At the end, they leave having commandeered an authority vehicle. And there's the sequence in between where Sarah's state of mind is expressed to us purely through visual and action. It's really, really powerful visual storytelling. In John's arc, it's childhood to manhood. In the Terminator's arc, he's moving from cyborg to father archetype. And in Sarah's arc, she's going from neurotic to mother across the course of the, the monomyth structure. Now, by the end of the fifth stage, they're all together and it becomes psychological storytelling because now we need to consistently express the development of the characters together. And this is one of my favorite scenes from Terminator 2. Uh, it's actually not in this theatrical edition. It's in the, uh, in the um, director's cut. Um, but I just want you to notice in this sequence here, it's tests, allies, and enemies. That's the name of the monomyth structure sequence. It's the conflict between John, who's coming into manhood and becoming responsible for himself, and Sarah, who's still stuck as the father archetype who's being powerful, controlling, and stern. They, what they've done in this scene, they've taken the, the Terminator has basically been deactivated. They've taken a chip out, and they're going to flip the switch on the chip that allows the Terminator to learn. It's actually the beginning of the Terminator's journey to becoming a, a, a human being. They actually missed this over in the cinematic release. But what Sarah's got in her hand right now is the, the, the chip that's inside the Terminator's head. Can you see the pin switch? No, no! Out of my way, John. Don't kill him. It, John. Not him. It. Okay, it. But we need it. You don't know what it's like to try to kill one of these things. And if something goes wrong, this could be our last chance to so move! Look, Mom, I'm never supposed to be this great military leader. Maybe you should start listening to my leadership ideas once in a while. So my own mother won't. How do you expect anyone else to? the conflict, the most universal of conflicts, of the mother needing to step aside to let the boy become a man. The use of the lighting, that John incidentally knocks the light, and the light continues to swing, because it's the effect, the, the whole concept of the pendulum effect of the dilemma they're going through. It's a decision-making process, and a pendulum visually represents that movement, left to right, left to right, what decision will be made. And then at the point where the conflict comes to an end, John steps back, and watch what happens to the light at the moment where Sarah has to make a decision. Now, this light is not a coincidence. And if you look at the composition, we had two hanging objects. On the right, overlaying Sarah, is this cold metal object. And she's holding a metal blunt hammer. And on the left, hanging in exactly the same way, the light behind him is the Terminator. And they're on the same side and Sarah isn't because she's currently cold and mechanical. And this is important because as the story progresses, her cold mechanical nature is going to climax with her becoming a Terminator. And these are all subtle build-ups that you never notice, but your brain does. So the reason the lighting is done in that way, the whole idea of uh, one side of the face is lit and one side is in darkness, it's a psychological motif. It happens in Jurassic Park. It happens in the moment where Dr. Allen decides whether he's going to look after the kids and become an, like a father figure. It's a transformational moment from light to dark or dark to light. So in the case of Sarah, it's going from stern father archetype to the maternal figure that John is clearly in need of as he's making his steps towards adulthood. So what we've got with Sarah as the story progresses is that she's sitting in the wrong section of the family archetype. We've already got a big, butch, stern, controlling, powerful Terminator. So the cycle, the balance of the, the ideal family unit is compromised. So as we move forward in the film, Sarah watches as John and the Terminator effectively become father and son, and she recognizes that he's the ultimate guardian. Then she looks and sees the, the, the family unit that she could never have, descends into yet another nightmare where she transforms her costume, it becomes black assassin Terminator. She watches a version of herself she never was and never will be, and then when she wakes up from this, having seen the entire uh, playground of children get burned by Skynet, she then decides that she's going to take action and leave John to be protected by the Terminator and sacrifice herself to stop the end of the world. 
So in that act, she becomes effectively a Terminator. And in doing so, we've got the glasses return as a motif. She's now looking like a Terminator. She drives like a Terminator. And she goes to go and find Dyson. And she tries to kill a human being. And the whole point of this situation is that she is now exactly what the Terminator was in the first film trying to kill her. She's killing a man for something he's never done. Now, she realizes this halfway through the scene. Dyson is basically saying, what have I done? And she descends and realizes what she's become, at which point John, future savior, salvation turns up, and this is the, the threshold scene. Now, at this point, when, she, when John comes to stop her, she realizes for the first time in her entire life why John is the future savior, because he wouldn't let a single man get killed. And in that moment, she has what's known in mythology as atonement. She has atonement with the sun. So she then moves over to the mother archetype and leaves the, the big butch assassin father archetype. And then we know that this has happened because of costume. John's father, Kyle, from the first film, always wears the same jacket, the same overcoat, which you see there. And when she has a moment with John, she hugs the same way she hugs Kyle. And then after she's come to terms with motherhood, the next scene where they go to Cyberdyne, she is wearing the jacket of the father archetype. John has now become a man. All that Kyle and Sarah ever wanted to do was get John through childhood. That was their goal. Once again, it's all unconscious, but your brain sees it. So. So we're now going to go through to the road back and to the resurrection section. Um, so the road back, effectively, uh, they go to Cyberdyne and they destroy all potential of Skynet ever existing. They destroy the, the hand that tried to kill Sarah in the first film. They hijack an authority vehicle. They make a run to try and get away from the T-1000, hence the road back. Uh, and then in this sequence, the SWAT van, the, the tire bursts, it collapses, and they have to change from a, uh, an authority vehicle to another vehicle in order to get away. And you're going to see the vehicle that James Cameron incidentally has come up behind their crashed SWAT van. Now, if you need to sell the idea that these guys are evolving into a family unit, what vehicle do you give them? Because that's not a common vehicle. That's not, oh yeah, we're flicking through the auto trader, that will do for the film. This has been selected explicitly because it sells the associations of warmth and homemade and family. There's a bed in the back, and they all sit in it like a little family. John's in the middle, father driving, Sarah's in the, in the passenger seat. This is all familiar social relationships being told in a weird context. It foreshadows what's about to happen. They're never going to be a family. And now watch what happens as their little truck crushes into the foundry where the climax of the film is going to happen. Just watch and notice what they crash into and what it means to your unconscious. The reason that they crash into a big spike is because Cameron is never letting you forget that the primary antagonist, the reason that they're having any crash at all, is the T-1000. If they just crash into a wall, it's completely theatrically dead. But if they crash into an object which has all of the primary qualities of the antagonist, then we remember what is separating these two characters, what is potentially killing them. We then go uh, to the build-up where basically Terminator gets his head smashed in, and there's, as with mythology, there's basically a, a death. In the case, it was Obi-Wan Kenobi before, but in this case, the Terminator is basically being pulverized. Um, and you'll even notice that even this simple scene, even the dualistic nature of the framing, Above and below, Terminator on the ground, lit in blue, and then when we look up, the T-1000 is red. And every single shot in the foundry scene always maintains this relationship. The Terminator dies, and then he becomes resurrected at the last possible minute, and then he's gonna move on, and he's gonna basically save the day. So we're now gonna go through the last action scene. I'm gonna wrap up. I'm really sorry if this is like, if you don't like Terminator, this must have been the worst use of your time. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, John. 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 Shoot!
So once again, red, foreground, T1000. Blue, background, Sarah. Left and right, as always, the T1000 always features on the left in any conflict, and he's always on the left, and red here as he's about to descend into the pit of judgment, hence Terminator 2, Judgment Day. And on the right, we have uplit blue as Sarah basically is now, for the first time in the film, truly empowered to protect John. And in the next scene, you're gonna see Sarah and the Terminator working together as a family unit. right, red, blue. And if you're paying attention, you'll notice that it's exactly the same scenario as the previous two conflicts. Exactly the same scene architecture because there are three sequences in this, three action sequences that represent three relationships. In the first action sequence, John and the father. In the second, Sarah is introduced and it's new relationships coming into the fold. And by the third scene, all three relationships are mended. At the beginning, John is screaming and at the end, he's reunited with the mother figure. This is all archetypal transformations. The first scene in the movie where Sarah interacts with the father archetype, with the Terminator, is hand contact and she's terrified, and by the end it's a handshake of mutual respect. The relationship between the child and the father starts off with a frosty relationship between a social rebel and a tin man robot, and ends with child archetype and the father. The relationship between the child archetype and the mother starts with Sarah, and she's a crazy bitch in a mental institute, and in the last scene of the movie, she's looking into the camera, warmly lit, while hugging her son. So the first relationship is, a, is consoled with a handshake, her fear is resolved. The second relationship, John finds a father figure. And the third relationship, he's reunited with the mother. It's the unification of the family unit told through visual action. The final step to finish the through thread of the entire hero's journey is childhood to manhood. And the ultimate symbol of a child becoming a man is the passing of the father figure. So when the Terminator descends, John is officially a man biological action that are supporting social archetypes going through metaphorical transformation. This is full triune stimulation, full use of your brain, told with the monomyth structure, which is why this guy is a total f dude. <laughs> That's pretty much it. Um, I hope that you like James Cameron and Terminator, and I hope that that was useful.